One of the greatest stories that occur in sports is the player comeback. It is so celebrated that MLB gives out the Comeback Player of the Year award in both leagues every season. In 2021, the winner in the National League was Buster Posey, who won it for the second time in his career. The first time he won it in 2012, Posey came back from a horrific injury that ended his 2011 season to win the MVP award and lead the Giants to a World Series championship. In the American League, the winner was Trey Mancini, who underwent an operation to remove a malignant tumor and went through six months of chemotherapy. Five months later, he was on the field again and won a World Series ring with the Astros in 2022. Amazing comebacks like these are somewhat rare, but do happen. And today, we'll be counting down 10 more inspiring comeback stories. Before getting to the main list, however, I have two honorable mentions in addition to Posey and Mancini. Honorable mention number one, World War II heroes. An extremely honorable mention goes to all the players who stopped their careers and went to serve their country in World War II, many of whom returned to the majors just as good, if not better, after three years of not playing the game. Some of the bigger names include Hank Greenberg, Yogi Berra, Lauren Spahn, Bob Feller, Joe DiMaggio, and Ted Williams. Many players were also seriously injured and still fought back to continue their careers. Cecil Travis suffered frostbite and nearly had his feet amputated and still returned to the majors. Dixie Howell was held at a German POW camp for six months. When he was finally freed by the Allied forces, the six foot two pitcher, whose normal weight was 210, weighed just 135 pounds. After missing nine full seasons of MLB, he came back to go eight and three with a 2.93 ERA for the Chicago White Sox. Honorable mention number two, Drew Robinson. In one of the most incredible stories in professional baseball history, we have former Texas Rangers prospect Drew Robinson. Robinson played seven seasons in the minor leagues, hitting 20 plus home runs in 2015 and 2016, then making the Rangers opening day roster in 2017. He struggled and ended up bouncing back and forth between the big leagues and the minors, finishing the year with a 224 average and six home runs. Robinson was eventually traded to the Cardinals, where he spent most of 2019 in the minors. So far, his MLB career had not gone the way he had hoped, and on January 6, 2020, he signed as a free agent with the Giants. Unfortunately, that was the year spring training suddenly ended due to COVID-19. Robinson returned to his home in Las Vegas and struggled with severe depression during a very depressing time. He decided to end his life and attempted to do so with a handgun which he aimed at his temple and fired. Miraculously, he wasn't killed and decided he wanted to live, calling 911 for help. He lost an eye along with his sense of smell and taste. Robinson figured his baseball career was over, but after taking a round of batting practice, he realized his ability to see the ball and time his swing wasn't that much different. As long as he could see the ball with one eye, Robinson believed he could still play and the Giants gave him the opportunity in an incredible comeback, Drew Robinson returned to professional baseball in 2021 and played in 38 AAA games for the Sacramento Rivercats. He hit three home runs, but unfortunately struggled to make consistent contact and never made it back to the big leagues, which is why he is an honorable mention. Still, the fact that Robinson survived a suicide attempt using a gun to the head, lost an eye, and still hit three more professional home runs is an incredible story on its own. Now let's move on to the top 10. Number 10, Tommy John. He has a name that no baseball fan has not heard of, but long before Tommy John's name was known for a surgery, he was a prospect with the Cleveland Indians. He had a great curveball and established himself as one of the premier starters in the game after being traded to the White Sox. In 1968, he made the All-Star team and had an ERA of 1.98. Later, after being traded to the Dodgers, he went 16-7 in 1973 with a 3.1 ERA. In 1974, he was 13-3 with a 2.59 ERA. At this point, he had had more than a solid 12-year big league career, leading the league in shutouts twice and in win-loss percentage twice. Unfortunately, it was at this time when he had what was considered at the time to be a career-ending injury, a torn UCL. There was just no coming back from that. That is, until orthopedic surgeon Frank Job, who worked for the Dodgers, performed a ligament replacement surgery on John. It was a revolutionary procedure that has since become standard surgery for pitchers, allowing them to continue their careers after injuries that were once considered career-ending. 
Tommy John indeed recovered while missing the entire 1975 season and returned in 76 to go 10-10 with a 3.09 ERA. The next year, for the first time in his career, he won 20 games and finished second in the Cy Young voting. The procedure was a massive success, as Tommy John not only recovered, but appeared to be even better. He made three straight All-Star teams and won 20 or more games in three out of four seasons. John played an incredible 14 more seasons after the surgery, giving him a 26-year career in which he won 288 games. The surgery has, of course, since been known as Tommy John surgery or simply Tommy John. Although his comeback has since become standard in the game today, since he was the first to do it and came back with such an insane degree of success, Tommy John is included in today's list of the top 10 comebacks of all time. Number 9. Jose Rijo Most hardcore baseball fans from the late 80s and early 90s will remember Reds pitcher Jose Rijo, who was a constant in the Reds rotation for many years. In 1991, he went 15-6 with a 2.51 ERA, finishing fourth for the Cy Young. He won 111 games over 12 seasons, made an all-star team, and led the Reds to a World Series ring in 1990, utterly dominating the A's by going 2-0 with a .59 ERA. In 1995, he was limited to just 14 starts due to elbow injuries. Later that season, he had to have Tommy John surgery. After rehabbing from Tommy John, shoulder injuries took over in 1996, causing further issues, and Riho ended up needing four major surgeries. He was basically done with baseball, and in October of 1998, became an unrestricted free agent who hadn't played in three years. 1999 came and went, and Riho did not play. At this point, he was already considered a Reds legend who had a 12-year career. He even appeared on the 2001 Hall of Fame ballot, receiving one vote. Then, on July 1st, in the middle of the 2001 season, the Reds signed the 36-year-old Rijo. Now coming out of the bullpen, Jose Rijo began his rehab assignment in single A more than five years after his last professional pitch. As someone who had already appeared on the Hall of Fame ballot, he worked his way through double A, then triple A, and finally got his call back up to the big leagues, where he had a 2.12 ERA in 13 appearances. He returned in 2002 as well, pitching out of the bullpen and starting nine games before retiring. Riho's story may not be the most dramatic, but considering that he was out of the game long enough to appear on the Hall of Fame ballot and still came back to give the Reds a strong bullpen arm is absolutely amazing, and Jose Riho makes number nine on the list. Number 8. Sean Burroughs Coming in at number 8 is third baseman Sean Burroughs, the son of Jeff Burroughs, who hit 240 big league home runs. Sean was supposed to be even better. As a child, he was a baseball prodigy, elite as both a pitcher and hitter. Burroughs threw back-to-back no-hitters in the Little League World Series and later led USA to a gold medal in the 2000 Olympics. Burroughs' minor league career started with a bang when he hit 363 in A-ball with 85 runs driven in. In 2001 in AAA, he hit 322. Sports Illustrated touted him as a can't-miss prospect. And at first, they seemed to be right. Burroughs hit 286 in his first full season, then 298 in 2004. He had a solid on-base percentage, didn't strike out much, and although he hadn't shown a lot of power, he looked like he was on a path to a successful big league career. Then, his career fell apart. A slide into second base at Dodger Stadium caused a broken blood capsule in his leg. He was traded to Tampa Bay where he hit just 190 and spent most of 2006 in AAA. He played in a few minor league games with the Mariners organization in 2007 and then, just like that, was completely out of baseball. Burroughs ended up wandering the streets of Las Vegas and struggling with substance abuse. He said that when he was at his worst, he was eating cheeseburgers out of garbage cans. Fortunately, his story does not end there. Nearly three years after his last professional game, Burroughs decided to try to get his life together and play baseball again. He says, I was out of shape with big black bags under my eyes, bad hair, hadn't shaved for weeks on end, hadn't eaten anything other than french fries and slurpees. Burroughs moved back in with his parents, started to work out, got back in baseball shape, and called his agent to find an opportunity anywhere. His agent got in touch with the Diamondbacks and convinced them to sign him to a minor league deal. He tore up AAA that year, hitting 412, earning a call-up to return to Major League Baseball. 
Burroughs hit 273 with the Diamondbacks, hitting his first MLB home run in six years. He retired after the 2013 season and never became the superstar he was expected to become, but still had one of the most inspiring comebacks in MLB history. Number 7. Matt Bush Up next is the number one overall pick in the 2004 MLB Draft, Matt Bush. He was a shortstop and pitcher with an incredible arm and powerful bat. In high school, Bush hit 450 with 11 home runs while maintaining a 0.73 ERA on the mound. He was a five-tool talent with an insane ceiling. However, troubles began before his professional career even got going. He was suspended for taking part in a fight outside a bar in Arizona. He eventually hit just 192 with no home runs in his first minor league season. The next season, his first full year, he hit just 221 with two home runs and A-ball, despite 453 at-bats. Things were not looking good on the field for the first overall pick. And off the field, things looked even worse. He was arrested a second time for fighting in a bar and received multiple DUIs. He showed up to games hungover and in 2007 hit 204 with a single home run. The Padres considered him a complete bust and traded him to the Blue Jays, who put him on a zero-tolerance policy. That lasted about a month when Bush reportedly threw a baseball at a woman's head then banged on her car window after she drew markings on his face at a party. The next day, he was released and missed the entire 2009 season. Every comeback attempt from there was thwarted by another one of his insane antics. In 2012, he was set to begin the season in AAA with the Rays organization, now as a pitcher, until he crashed his car three times in a matter of hours, first colliding with another car on an illegal U-turn, then hitting a light pole, then knocking a 72-year-old man from his motorcycle, severely injuring him. He left the scene of each accident. He spent the entire 2012 season in jail and was charged with a long list of counts, including one count of DUI with serious bodily injury and two counts of leaving the scene of an accident. He was released from prison in October 2015 and hadn't played a game of professional baseball in over four years. He got a job at Golden Corral and, in an attempt to return to the game, held a showcase right there in the Golden Corral parking lot, since it was the only place he was allowed to go. Incredibly, he impressed Rangers scouts enough that they brought him to Texas in December for a more formal tryout. And to make a very long story short, Bush signed with the Rangers, went to the minors, and earned his first call up to the majors, 12 years after being taken first overall in the 2004 MLB draft. Bush was kept on a no tolerance policy with several requirements and stipulations, and this time he stuck to it. He went 7 and 2 with a 2.48 ERA in 2016 and began an MLB career that continues today with the Milwaukee Brewers. Although there's no possible way to excuse Bush's behavior early in his career, he did serve his time and completely change his life while making one of the most improbable comebacks of all time. Number 6, Rick Ankiel. Coming in at number 6 is a former pitcher named Rick Ankiel. In high school, Ankiel was a stud going 11-1 with a .47 ERA and 162 strikeouts in 74 innings. He was a hot name in the draft and was selected in the second round by the St. Louis Cardinals, receiving a signing bonus of $2,500,000. He immediately impressed in the low minor leagues, striking out 222 batters in 161 innings with an ERA of 2.63. The next year, between AA and AAA, he was even better, with a 2.35 ERA and 194 strikeouts in 134 innings. He didn't walk a ton of hitters and showed the same confidence that he had in high school. There was no reason to think Ankiel wouldn't be an ace in the big leagues. He had an impressive rookie season in 2000, going 11-7 with a 3.5 ERA and 194 strikeouts, finishing second in the Rookie of the Year voting. The Cardinals made the playoffs that year, and in Ankiel's first playoff start, something strange happened. After throwing two scoreless innings, he suddenly had a complete meltdown, walking four batters and throwing five wild pitches in one inning. It was considered a freak incident, and since the Cardinals won the game, no one thought much more of it. That is, until his next start, Game 2 of the NLCS, when five of Ankiel's first 20 pitches went past the catcher. He was removed. In his next appearance, more of the same. He faced four batters, walked two, and threw two wild pitches. Rick Ankiel had the yips. 
He returned to the team in 2001 and his problems were not fixed. In 24 innings, he walked 25 batters and threw five wild pitches, causing a demotion to AAA where he went completely next level, walking 17 batters and throwing 12 wild pitches in just four and a third innings. Later, a left elbow sprain and Tommy John surgery kept him largely out of MLB for the next two years. His career seemed to be over. Or was it? During 2005 spring training, Rick Ankiel announced that he was switching to the outfield to be a hitter. He had to start his career all over again, going back to single A, where he showed impressive power, earning a call-up to double A. Unfortunately, he injured his knee in 2006 and missed the entire year. Was this the end of his career? Not even close. In 2007, in triple A, Ankiel crushed 32 home runs, earned a promotion to the big leagues, and smashed a home run in his first big league game as an offensive player. He went on to play seven years in the big leagues as a hitter, finishing his career with 251 home runs, along with some dramatic postseason bombs, such as a game-winning home run for Atlanta in the 2010 NLDS against the Giants. For one of the best pitching prospects in the game to get the yips and completely lose his control and then turn around and have an extremely strong career as an MLB hitter, despite not regularly hitting since high school, is absolutely incredible. And Rick Ankiel's comeback is one of the greatest in MLB history. Number five, Tony Conigliero. Next up is Tony Conigliero, who played mostly for the Boston Red Sox. His pro career started in 1963 when he tore up the minor leagues, hitting 363 with 24 home runs. The next year, he was in the Red Sox lineup and hit 290 with 24 home runs, followed by a league leading 32 bombs in 1965, becoming the youngest American League player to ever lead the league in home runs. The Red Sox had a superstar, and he made the All-Star team in 1967. He hit his 100th home run at just 22 years old. Then, everything changed during a game on August 18, 1967, against the California Angels. Facing pitcher Jack Hamilton, a pitch struck Conigliero in the face, causing a linear fracture of his left cheekbone, a dislocated jaw, and severe damage to his left retina. He was carried off the field on a stretcher and was questionable if he would ever play again. Conigliaro's eyesight was permanently damaged. He missed two seasons entirely. Then, in 1969, two and a half years after playing his last game, Conigliaro attempted a comeback. The Red Sox were happy to give him the opportunity but didn't know what to expect. With limited eyesight, Conigliaro's comeback was astonishing as he hit 20 home runs with a .255 average driving in 82 runs. The next year, he set a career high in home runs and RBIs with 36 and 116 respectively while hitting 266. His amazing comeback inspired the Tony Conigliaro Award, which has since been awarded to those who overcome adversity. Unfortunately, his eyesight worsened as he entered his 30s and Conigliaro was forced to retire, but the fact that he came back from such a horrific injury to play four more years, including a career year, is truly inspirational. Number four, Josh Hamilton. Coming in at number four is another number one overall pick in the MLB draft, Josh Hamilton. He was an absolute beast in high school, hitting 529 with 13 home runs in 25 games his senior year. He could fly on the base paths and had a cannon for an arm. The Tampa Bay Devil Rays took him first overall in the 99 draft and that year he hit 312 with 10 home runs in the low minor leagues. The next year, he made the South Atlantic League All-Star team, hitting 302 with 13 home runs in 96 games. Unfortunately, things began to unravel in 2001 after he was involved in a car accident resulting in injuries to his parents. After landing on the disabled list due to back injuries, Hamilton hung out at tattoo parlors, purchasing two tattoos a day while abusing cocaine and alcohol. He had plenty of cash with a $3.96 million bonus and used it to fall deeper and deeper into this new lifestyle. The Devil Rays sent him to the Betty Ford Center, but he checked himself out after just eight days. In 2003, he failed to show up for a mandatory drug test and was suspended by MLB. He was now out of baseball completely and graduated from cocaine to crack, even stealing from his own family to feed his addiction. 
A few times Hamilton tried to come back to baseball but continued to either relapse or get arrested. Finally, in 2006, a man named Roy Silver hired Hamilton to work at his baseball facility in Florida where he stayed clean, sleeping on an air mattress in one of the offices. In 2007, after being removed from the 40-man roster, the Cubs claimed Hamilton in the Rule 5 draft, promptly trading him to the Reds. Part of the stipulation of the Rule 5 draft is that the player must stay on the Major League roster for the entire season or be returned to the original team, in this case, the Devil Rays. Hamilton tore it up in spring training in 2007 and earned a spot on the roster, making his big league debut eight years after being drafted. He hit 292 with 19 home runs, an incredible feat considering he had barely played the game in the last five years. The Reds traded him to the Rangers that offseason, and he became an absolute superstar in Texas, hitting 304 with 32 home runs and an insane 130 runs driven in. He got the attention of every MLB fan at the Home Run Derby that year, smashing a record 28 home runs in the first round. Hamilton made five straight All-Star teams, won an MVP in 2010, and even hit four home runs in a single game. Eventually, he experienced some relapses and injuries which slowed down his career, but Josh Hamilton had an insane five-year stretch in Texas proving that had he never fallen into a lifestyle of drugs and alcohol, Hamilton would have easily been a Hall of Famer and possibly one of the greatest to ever play the game. Still, the fact that he came back from the depths of darkness he was in to become an MLB superstar and MVP is incredible and one of the greatest comebacks of all time. Number three, Dave Dravecki. Next up is a pitcher named Dave Dravecki. He was a solid left-handed arm in the San Diego Padres rotation for several years in the 80s, making an all-star team in 1983 and maintaining an ERA around three every season. On July 4th, 1987, the San Francisco Giants traded for him, along with Craig Lefferts and Kevin Mitchell, for Mark Grant, Mark Davis, and Chris Brown. He pitched well for the Giants, including a shutout performance in the 1987 playoffs against St. Louis. In 1988, he was pitching well with a 3.16 ERA after seven starts when a cancerous tumor was found in his pitching arm. It was a rare and aggressive tumor known as a desmoid tumor. Unfortunately, it was positioned on his left deltoid muscle, a muscle that is needed by pitchers. Doctors would have to remove the tumor and surrounding muscle a huge portion of his arm in order to save his arm and his life. The surgery was performed in October of 1988 and a half of the deltoid muscle was removed. The humerus bone was frozen as well in order to kill all of the cancerous cells. Doctors advised him that he would never pitch again. Dave had other plans. His rehab was astonishingly fast, going from not being able to move his arm at all to lifting one pound dumbbells to actually pitching all in a matter of months, and by 1989, Dravecki already felt ready to pitch again, although doctors urged him to wait until at least 1990. They feared that the frozen humerus bone could snap if it is stressed too early. But Dravecki was determined to return that year, and he did, returning to the minor leagues in 1989 on a rehab assignment, where he threw three complete games, including a shutout with an ERA of 1.8. It convinced the Giants that he was ready for an official comeback game, and it occurred on August 10, 1989 in an amazing day at Candlestick Park. Dravecki pitched eight innings, defeating the Reds 4-3, despite the doctor's prediction that he would lose 95% of the use of his left arm. It was one of the most inspiring comebacks of all time, and there was absolute magic in the air that day in San Francisco. Unfortunately, it was short-lived as during his next start in Montreal, he felt a strange tingling in his arm, continued to pitch anyway, and broke his arm on a pitch. Later, the cancer returned with a vengeance, and he had to have his arm amputated. Although he probably should have waited until at least 1990, as doctors recommended, Dravecki is an absolutely amazing athlete with incredible determination, and his comeback was one of the most inspiring moments in baseball history. Dave Dravecki continues to travel the country today and give motivational speeches. Number two, Eddie Waitkus. Coming in at number two on my list of the top 10 inspirational MLB comebacks of all time is first baseman Eddie Waitkus. Waitkus began his pro career with the Cubs organization in 1939, hitting 326 in the minor leagues and earning his first promotion to the big leagues by 1941. In 42, he spent the year in the minors hitting 336 for the Los Angeles Angels of the Pacific Coast League. Then, 
World War II happened. He was a hero, earning four bronze stars. On one occasion, he left his foxhole, entering into enemy gunfire to save his comrade's life. He returned to baseball in 1946 after missing three entire seasons due to the war and hit 304 for the Cubs, eventually becoming an all-star first baseman. But the story does not end there. This was just his first comeback. And in June of 1949, Waitkus was hitting very well for his new team, the Philadelphia Phillies, with a 306 batting average. But there was a mad fan from Chicago who had worshipped Waitkus, named Ruth Ann Steinhagen. She had created a shrine to him with hundreds of photos and newspaper clippings. Steinhagen even set a plate for him at the dinner table. After he left to play for the Phillies, she fantasized about killing him. When the Phillies came to Chicago for a series against the Cubs, she checked into the same hotel that he was staying in and had the bellboy give him a note, urging him to come see her for some important information that he would want to know. When he arrived at her room, she shot him with a 22 caliber rifle. There are some disputes over what was said, if anything, but according to Waitkus's friend and roommate, Waitkus said that she said, if I can't have you, nobody else can. The bullet barely missed his heart, and during the operation, he almost died several times. Incredibly, Waitkus recovered and returned in 1950, playing six more years in the majors. He hit 289 in 1951 and then 291 in 53. If his story sounds familiar, it may be because it was part of the inspiration for the film The Natural, which was Eddie Waitkus's nickname. Waitkus makes number two on this list because not only did he make an amazing comeback, from being a war hero, but he also came back from being shot and nearly killed by an insane fan. Number one, Lou Brissy. My number one most inspirational comeback in MLB history goes to former MLB pitcher Lou Brissy. Brissy was born in Anderson, South Carolina in 1924 and grew up in the town of War Shoals, a location where the most popular baseball was played in local textile leagues. Brissy's career began in 1940 on the War Shoals baseball team. He was a talented young pitcher who, as a dominating lefty at six foot four, caught the attention of Philadelphia A's manager Connie Mack in 1941. He signed a contract with the A's with the understanding that he would pitch for three years in college and then begin his professional career. Unfortunately, before he could complete his college career, World War II broke out and he joined the United States Army. By 1943, he had deployed to Italy and his unit, the 88th Infantry Division, saw a lot of action and suffered many casualties. After 14 months of fighting, in December of 1944, his unit came under heavy artillery fire. At least 12 men were killed in the attack, and one explosion went off near Brissy, whose last memory before falling unconscious was of himself, half in and half out of the water, with one foot severely damaged and the other completely missing. He was left for dead and found several hours later with his left tibia and shin bone shattered into 30 pieces. Doctors informed him that the leg would have to be amputated, but Brissy persuaded them to try and save it so that he could eventually play ball again. He had 23 surgeries and 40 blood transfusions performed over two years, reconstructing his leg with wire. Connie Mack heard about the severity of his injury and wrote to Brissy, saying that his duty was to get well and whenever he was ready to play, Mac would make sure he got the opportunity. That meant an awful lot to me, said Brissy, was a tremendous motivator. Eventually, after a year of rehab, he could walk with a cane. In 1945, at Shy Park, he held a workout for Connie Mack, trying to pitch on crutches. Mack later said, I'll never forget how he looked last summer. He had just undergone an operation and was about to undergo another one. He was on crutches, and I thought, poor boy, he'll never be able to pitch again. For another year, he just kept on rehabbing, pushing through the pain, and learning how to pitch again. Finally, in 1947, six years after he first signed with the A's, Connie Mack gave him the opportunity he promised. He was sent to A-ball and was absolutely amazing, going 23-5 with a 1.91 ERA and 278 strikeouts. After the minor league season ended, he was promoted, and against all odds, Lou Brissy made it to the major leagues. In 1948, he went 14-10 and 10 with a 4.13 ERA, kicking off a seven-year major league career. After retirement, he confirmed that he pitched through severe pain every game. His career ERA is a respectable 4.17, and there's no telling how good he would have been 
had the injury never occurred. But what he did may have been even more impressive than a Hall of Fame career, and he is number one on today's list of the most inspirational comebacks in baseball history. And that does it for today's video. There are so many other amazing stories I'm sure I missed, so please feel free to share them in the comment section down below. Thank you so much for checking out this video. And remember, as Lou Brissy once said, if someone tells you that you cannot climb the mountain, you set out and find a way to do it. Have a great day, and we will talk to you next time.